God is so good to us. I don't know how else to say it, but God is good to us. This, this evening, I'm going to preach uh, just a few minutes about uh, a man after God's heart. Now, you all know this phrase or this saying when it refers to King David, don't you? Well, <clears throat> it also refers to somebody else in the Old Testament that maybe you aren't that familiar with, and that's the, my message tonight. For 400 years after God, for 400 years, the children of Israel were captive in Egypt. And we all know the story. And when they, God delivered them with a mighty deliverance, right? We know the, the scripture tells us that. And after they were delivered from Egypt, they had one king. And that was the Lord himself, wasn't it? For all of those years, God basically ruled over his people. He ruled and he reigned. And as long as God's children did what they were supposed to do, well, they had it pretty good, didn't they? Yeah? And when they didn't do what they were supposed to do, well, there was consequences every single time. It's kind of like us today, if you, if you get my drift, right? It kind of goes the same way. But the, the, there came a time when the children of Israel began to take their eyes off of God. And they began to look around at all the other countries round about them. And they said, hmm, I like that system they got over there. Man, look what they got. You know, they, 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 they got a king over there that leads them into battle. He does all these great things, you know, and, and, and everybody but us has that. Have you ever thought to yourself, everybody but me gets to do whatever or has been able to do whatever? There's a real danger in that, isn't there? Because we forget sometimes how blessed we already are when we start looking at what everybody else is doing and everybody else has and we forget what we have been blessed with. Right. And the children of Israel went to the prophet Samuel and he, they said, Now Samuel, we've decided that we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. We don't want God to be our king anymore. He can still be God and all that kind of good stuff. But when it comes to the affairs and different things in the country, no, we want to be like everybody else all around us. And Samuel protested. and He said, no, you don't want that. You really don't want that. And Samuel went to the Lord with this, with this dilemma. And he said, Lord, I don't know what to do here because these people, and of course we know God told Samuel, Samuel, listen, son, it's not you they're rejecting, but it's me, right? And we all understand <clears throat> that that's how that went down. And so we get to the point where Samuel is about to do what they ask, but before he gives them a king, he has a word for the children of Israel. And he gave them some inside information about the kind of man they were going to get to be their king. In fact, Samuel went on to tell him that this man is going to take your sons away from you. Think about that. You and your children are going to plow his ground, and he's going to reap the benefit of all your hard work. He's going to take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards. He, in fact, he's going to take the very best of your fields. Is this what you really want? Yes, that's what we want. We, we don't care about any of that. We just want to be like everybody else. We want to be like everybody else. And Samuel, if you'll go to slide two, Justin, Samuel finished his message by telling them that there's coming a day that you're going to cry out and you're going to say, God, we don't want this anymore. And God's going to say, I'm not going to hear you. You had an opportunity. You had it all, and you didn't want it. Okay? And that set a precedent for the children of Israel. God gave them a king named Saul. And that's the, my message tonight is about King Saul. The very first king of Israel. He stood head and shoulders above all of his countrymen, didn't he? He was somebody that was good to look at. When you would look at him, he was bigger, tougher, stronger, faster than everybody else. So why wouldn't they want this man to be their king, right? But in the second year of his reign, only two years on the job. Two years on the job, Saul is faced with a dilemma, and that's my message tonight. In verse number 7, if you, if you turn to 1 Samuel, if you want to stand for the word, and we're going to read it off the screen. 
And verse number 7 of, uh, I didn't put the chapter up there, did I? Well, I don't have it in my notes either. So, believe me, it's in here. Believe me, it's in here. There you go. Thank you. Well, I have two different versions going here, so. All right. So let's begin reading. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, King Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Now what's happened here, the Philistines have amassed an army. 30,000 chariots, and who knows how many foot soldiers, but they've assembled themselves to go to battle against Israel. And then verse number 8 says, he waited, Saul waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. Now Samuel had already met with Saul and told him that when you go and depart, you wait on me because, and you wait seven days because I'm coming to give you a word. So that's what he's referring to here. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and all the people were scattered from him. So Saul, he said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he, Saul, offered the burnt offering. Now it happened. Here we go. As soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, here comes Samuel. That Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, I love this. What have you done? Now we can read that and say, what have you done? But I don't think that's how he said it. Because I think what he said was, what did you do? Because he knew. He, this was an hour after the, the sacrifice was offered. He could smell it. He knew exactly what he had done. So he said to Saul, what did you do? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, and you didn't come within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered together at, at Mishmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I, and if I could say underline it, underline I, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. We're going to conclude in verse 14. And Samuel said to Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And you can be seated. <clears throat> Samuel tells Saul, you know what I told you. I told you to wait until I come. But Saul got impatient when he saw and he got fearful actually. Why? Because all of his people started leaving him. They All they could see was the big army, the 30,000 chariots and the thousands and thousands of foot soldiers getting ready to, to, to go to battle with them. And they started hiding in the caves and in the rocks and the pits and wherever they could find a place to hide, that's what happened to them. And Saul became fearful. On the seventh day when Samuel had still not arrived, Saul realized that something is wrong and the people became fearful and they scattered and basically what happened was they all abandoned him. And there he is pretty much by himself. And Saul panics. He knows what's going to happen. Instead of Saul, if there ever was a time when the king should have called upon the name of the Lord, it was right now. Beloved, when you're in trouble, when your back's against the wall, that is the best time for you to call upon God. But you see what the enemy does, the enemy strikes fear in our mind, and then it leaves our mind and gets into our heart, doesn't it? And we don't see any way out. And that's how King Saul was looking at this situation. I'm about to be overrun. There's no hope for me. The only thing I know to do is what I've seen the prophet do. I'm going to offer up a sacrifice. Only here's the problem with that. Saul was a king. He was not a priest. He had no business taking the priest's office and doing what only they were permitted by God to do. Amen. In other words, Saul stepped out of his calling thinking that, well, I've just become the king, therefore I can do whatever and God is going to honor me. 
And Saul found out what a lot of us find out is when we step out of the calling that God has placed in our life and we try to do it a different way or go a different direction than the direction God has appointed us to go, it almost always leads down the path of destruction and trouble and heartache, does it not? Many of us in here are living testimonies of what happens when we don't do it God's way. Amen? Amen. 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 Many of you are sitting here, you're too embarrassed to nod your head, but you know I'm telling you the truth. Many of us have had a hard road to hoe. Why? It wasn't because God was mean to us. It's because we decided that we knew better than God how I should do this, right? Amen. Amen. And we end up paying the price, okay? Fear compelled Saul to step out of his office into a place he had no business going to. He had no business doing what he did. And the first words out of Samuel the prophet was, what have you done? And what did Saul say to him? Ever the excuse maker, Saul said that, he said that he felt like he had to do something. And he said in the text, I felt compelled to do it. In other words, he, didn't, he knew he didn't do the right thing. So what did he do? He offered up excuse. Do yeah. anybody know any excuse makers in here? Huh? Hello? The first thing that he did, he had to do something. And Saul responded to him by simply saying, you have done foolishly. You are the king. God called you out of all of your countrymen. Saul, you've only been on the job two years. Surely by now you know that when God says to do something as the king of God's people, you have to do what thus saith God. Instead, you did exactly opposite of what I told you to do. Now Saul's in trouble in more ways than one. And Saul, Samuel responds and he says, You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. Because you see, here's the, here's the deal. Despite all the excuses, all the reason, all the blame game that, that Saul wanted to play, the bottom line is still the bottom line. Saul had a responsibility to abide in the calling that God placed him. Saul had a responsibility to obey, didn't he? Saul, being the king, was an example. Everybody looked to the king for direction and leadership, didn't they? And he failed. Saul failed. Samuel doesn't mince words with Saul and he tells him. God's not pleased. God commanded you to do something and you did exactly opposite. Had you been obedient to what God told you. Listen to this. The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. How many of you know what a dynasty is? When we talk about kings and queens and dynasties and all that, the idea behind a dynasty, especially when it relates to the king of kingdom of, or the king of Israel, was that when the king passed on, his sons would take his place, right? And his sons after him. His, in other words, a continuous dynasty. That was going to be Saul's legacy. That was going to be Saul's legacy if he had only obeyed God. And instead of having a legacy of a, of a descendant upon the throne of Israel forever, God took it from him and gave it to somebody else. And we happen to know tonight that that somebody else was a little shepherd boy out in the field tending daddy's sheep, didn't he? Because God found in him what he wanted to see in Saul. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here. God had sought for himself. A man after his own heart, didn't he? Yeah. The whole point of this is, though Saul is still king, Saul has the title, doesn't he? He has the position. He has the chair. He has the throne, whatever you want to call it. But Saul lost it all. Why? Because he refused to wait upon God. I don't know if you can understand what I'm about to say, but I know what it's like to be without any place else to turn to. I've been in that position, and many of you have too, where you just know that, God, there's no, I've done everything I can humanly do to get 
to fix this, to, fight, to pay for this, to make a way, whatever it might be. I've done everything that I know to do and everything I've tried, it will not work. But when we get to that place of desperation where we finally give up trying to do it ourselves and give it to God and say, God, this is bigger than me. God, I can't do this. I've wasted all of this money. I've done all these things. Why? Because I thought I could fix it and God says if you'd have just looked to me in the first place if you would have just went my way in the first place Saul still has the title but it no longer carries the respect it once did and while I'm here I'm going to stop for a little bit because I want to talk to you tonight I want to tell you tonight how important it is that we guard our hearts when it comes to the call of God in our life you and I tonight have a responsibility and it's a grave responsibility to a holy God that we guard our heart and not allow the enemy to come in and corrupt what God is wanting to do in our life in our homes and in our families beloved I have seen so many in the church get carried away with having titles it's unbelievable I've seen it in the business world where I've had people say to me I don't even care about the money I just want that title it's amazing how people get I don't know what it is it's like a, a switch gets flipped a button gets pressed something takes over them because they want that prestige that comes with that title and it's the same way in the church it's the same way in the church we want to be the pastor we want to be the associate we want to be the youth guy we want to do all these different things up here why because I want that title because with that title we think comes everybody gonna look up to me come on you know what I'm telling you it's the truth and because we feel that way why because pride has entered into our heart it's no longer about what can I do for God. What it has now become is what can God do for me? How can God elevate me so that everybody will look at me and think of I am something special? And you know I'm telling you the truth, right? What we don't understand is that titles can carry with them a tremendous responsibility, especially in the household of God. Everything that you do, if you have a calling that God has placed on your life, everything that you do is under scrutiny by God. Each and every decision you make has to be made with one thought in mind. How will this impact what God has called me to do? And when we don't take, that, take it that serious, when we think we can just go off and do it our way, what we have done, we've told God that I know better than you how to handle your business. You see, only God knows how to handle his business. You and I, we don't have a clue how to handle God's business, that he doesn't educate us and train us and anoint us and push us in the right direction amazing isn't it I can't tell you the thousands of times uh, that decisions are made based upon God is this going to be something that that magnifies you that edifies you or is this going to be something that brings reproach and everything we do as children of God you don't have to be the preacher it doesn't make any difference you're called of God you're supposed to be salt and light are you not amen we're all called you heard this morning our pastor tell us that our candle can't be put under a bushel amen we're supposed to be shining and if our light is broadcasting things that are not pleasing to God or that bring reproach upon the body of Christ beloved we need to get ourselves back to the altar and get things right with God so that he can take us forward unto the next level. Amen. Praise God. A lot of people like to toss around the saying today that, well, that God doesn't call the equipped. Uh, he equips the called. There's a whole lot of truth in that. Uh, he most certainly does. Uh, and I've learned that one of the things he equips us with is a good common sense to guard our hearts. Amen. You'd be amazed at how many today want to jump behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and as soon as they get home on Sunday afternoon or Sunday night, they're on their computer looking at things they ought not be looking at. Amen. Uh, I, you wouldn't believe how many people can get up here and preach the house down, but yet they'll go home and they'll open up their liquor cabinet and start taking a drink or two. You think that doesn't happen, but I'm here to tell you that it does. It does. Beloved, this is a holy calling. 
Saul was called with a holy calling. You and I have been called with a holy calling. I said holy, not unholy, but holy calling because we serve a holy God, Brother Bobby. We serve a God who is so holy and pure that were it not for the Lord Jesus Christ, he would be unapproachable. But thanks be unto God that we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. He was Jesus Christ, the righteous Son of God, who sits at the right hand of the Father, making an intercession for you and I. If I falter, I know who I can go to. If I stumble along the way, I don't have to be like Saul and go completely opposite of what God said for me to do. If I trip up and make a mistake, I know all I can do is call upon the name of the Lord. Oh, if Saul would have only called upon the name of the Lord, if he would have only done that, praise God. Do you realize, you and I can spend our whole life, I'll say our whole adult life, in service to God. God can use you in mighty ways, only to have it all taken away. Because of one act of disobedience. I told you this is the holy calling. Amen. I'm going to say some things that you might think is hard. But I think we need to get it out, on the, out in the open. We can't, we got no time to play church. Every, every Sunday. Without fail. I come in this church and I hear some of you talking about... The Lord is surely coming soon. And we know that he is. But you know something? The question is, are we just talking about it? Or are we living it? Are we living it? Are we living this thing out? Saul's going to be on the throne for another 20 years. He doesn't know that. But the scriptures tell us Saul's been on the, will be on the throne for another 20 years. But it'll never be the same because of what he did. Because of what he did. Because he did not have God's best interest at heart. You and I, we're not a King Saul. I doubt that any of us will ever be elevated to a position like that. But you know what? We've been elevated to a position much greater than an earthly king. Amen? We serve a God. You and I have been lifted up to set by the Lord in heavenly places. God has called us with a holy calling. He's covered you with his blood. Amen? You know, when you think of Saul, we might think the punishment doesn't fit the crime. After all, it was just one little act of disobedience. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? It's not a big deal at all, is it? It's the, taking the, the kingship away from me. The, my sons aren't going to be able to be on the throne. That's kind of harsh for what little bit I did here, right? But oh, you and I, all we can do is look at what Saul did on the surface. But how many of you know God sees the heart? God sees the heart, doesn't he? And Saul failed the heart test. Saul failed the heart test. He might have been a great king as far as a military leader. Don't know. He was never going to get the opportunity to prove himself again. A couple of years after this incident, Saul is confronted one more time with a decision. Samuel told him, he says, you go to the Amalekites and I want you to destroy every one of them. The little kids, the, the aged, don't leave any of them. Destroy everything they have. Don't you bring anything back with you. Destroy everything. And what did he do? He didn't do that, did he? Instead of obeying God, he followed his own heart. He didn't destroy everything, but he kept the best for himself. And ever the excuse maker, what did he do? He said, the people did it. It wasn't me, the people did it. Samuel, I, I, I obeyed God. It was these folks. They're the ones that, that are guilty, right? You see, God loves Israel. God loves Israel. He's going to raise up another king. Saul was a man after Israel's heart. 
Let that sink in. Saul was not a man after God's own heart. Saul was after Israel's heart. What does that mean? He wanted the admiration and praise of those that were below him. That's what he wanted. And that's what pride does to us. That's what pride will do to us. Because you see, God is determined that he's going to give Israel a man after his own heart. And please get what I'm about to say here. It'd be easy to say that Saul lost the kingdom, the kingdom because of his disobedience. And in one, one sense, he certainly did. But it was more than that. And here's why it was more than that. Saul disobeyed what the prophet had told him to do. And God took his kingdom from him. Along comes David just a few years later. David committed many sins. And we all know that, don't we? But God did not take David's kingdom or his kingship. What's the difference? Here's the difference. You see, the biggest issue with Saul was that he failed when it came to his heart. You see, a man after God's heart honors the Lord. All he cares about is God and God's will. Saul cared about Saul's heart and Saul's will. And whenever our will takes precedent over God's will, we will fail every time. We will fail every time. You see, David was a man after God's heart in a way that he knew God's will was the most important thing. And even when David sinned, even when David did not do what God told him to do, it was out of the, the weakness of his flesh. Saul did it out of a disregard for God. There's a difference. There is a difference. You see, a man after God's heart enthrones God as the king of his life. Think about that. For Saul, Saul was king. For David, the Lord was the king. You see the difference, right? And that difference is what makes us make the decisions and the choices that we do. And the question we've all got to ask tonight is, are we a man or a woman after God's own heart? That's an important question. And we need to be able to answer that question before the Lord. You see, thought, Saul thought it was important to, to go to God because it might help him win the battle. That's all he cared about. God to help him achieve his goals. For David, God himself was the goal. You see the difference? It's a big difference, isn't it? A man after God's heart has a soft, repentant heart. When Saul was confronted by his sin, what did he do? He offered excuses, didn't he? He offered excuses. You see, a man, or when David was confronted with his sin... What did he do? He simply said to the prophet Nathan, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't make excuse, did he? He simply said, God, I have sinned against you. Do you believe God honors that? I know that he does. I know that he does. A man after God's heart loves other people. What happened to Saul when he made this grievous error? He became bitter. He lived more and more in seclusion. You couldn't stand to be around the guy. Eventually, he spent most of his energy trying to kill David after he found out David was going to be his successor. You see, that's what bitterness does when we turn around and do something contrary to what God wants us to do. David was a man after God's heart in the way that he loved other people, didn't he? And we can find that in 1 Samuel 22, that when David was down and out, he still loved and he served those that were even in worse shape than he was. Go to the next couple of slides, would you? Go to the next one, please. So David's in the cave and everybody that was with him, look at it. They were in distress. They were in a hard way, weren't they? Everybody was in debt. Everybody was, was just fed up. Everybody was in a, in a bad way. And so David basically took them in and became their leader and about 400 of them. David didn't just discard people because of what he did, but David was still attracted to people who needed an answer. David was a warrior who killed hundreds of men with his own hands. That isn't all that David was. David was a fugitive. David was a traitor. David was a man who, who backslid. He was an adulterer. David was a murderer, wasn't he? You see, he could do all of that, and still God called him a man after his own heart. Why? Because his heart, he, he turned to God in repentance. 
And you see, that's the difference. Beloved, we have got to get to the point where we are no longer content to just simply do and be just to show up. I say this all the time, and maybe you're tired of me saying this, but there is a lot more that we need to be doing in order to reach the people in this community. And we need help. All right? I've, I've said this before. There is a work for all of us to do if we'll just do it. Beloved, trials and tests reveal the true character of a Christian. How many would believe that? When you go through a trial and a test... Just like Saul was put to the test, it will reveal your true character. The trials and tests have a way of separating the pretenders from the contenders. Amen? Amen. You see, when everything's going their way, pretenders, they look good, don't they? Everything's going great. Yet let a severe trial come and the pretender will fall back away almost every time. Contenders, on the other hand, are always pressing toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. How many would say that you're a contender tonight? And I hope that you are not a pretender. Because if you are, you're going down the wrong path. Pretenders, hear me now. Pretenders cannot sail in the storm. Their water has to be smooth and glassy. Amen. They'll follow Jesus as far as the Mount of Olives. But they won't go with him to Mount Calvary. Come on. I'm going to say that again. Uh, if all we are is a pretender, if we're all just putting on a show and we don't really have what we say we have, we'll follow Jesus so far. But when it gets to be hard and when that road gets to be rough, uh, we're going to say no more. We're going to draw the line in the sand because I can't go and do this anymore. We've got to be contenders who will always be willing to walk that same rocky road. You see, pretenders, they're the ones that cling to the worldly brand of Christianity. You know what I'm referring to here tonight, don't you? A weak, deluded Christianity. It doesn't offend anyone because there's no content to it. It's everything is good. Everything is cotton candy and ice cream cones. And there's never going to be any hardship. And come follow me and sign up in my my membership book and I guarantee you, your life will be you'll live your blessed life 24-7 365 you'll never have another problem how many of you know that that's utter foolishness that is absolutely utter foolishness contenders on the other hand realize they serve a holy God and they reject this world and all it offers why because they know that it's soon going to pass away everything that we hold so dear here one day we're going to let it go that's why we've got to be sure and faithful tonight to abide in the calling that God has called you in and to be obedient to his voice and don't offer up excuses to God as to why excuses don't come Cut it. Amen. And when I look through the lens of Scripture, what I see is a world turning against God more than it ever has. Amen. I see this world turning against everybody that calls themselves a child of God. When I look at things today, and again, I tend to look at everything in the world. I have a biblical worldview. I tend to look at everything through Scripture. What I see is this world, uh, I see this world having a hatred for anything associated with God. And we see that happening today, do we not? But I also see God looking for a people who will be a man and a woman after his heart. Amen. Who will still, in spite or despite all this going on, that they, God is still looking for somebody that will step out. Beloved, if you've been a distant follower, if you've been following on the fringe, you can't do that any longer. You've got to get in. You've got to get in. Beloved, you've got to get in. God is looking for those who will be a man or a woman after his heart.
God is looking for those that will, whose heart will pant after him like the deer pants for the water. God is looking for those that he can take from deep to deep. God is looking for those that he can, that he can draw near to and that those that will draw near to him. Do you understand what's going on in the world today? Do we, do we fully grasp what's happening today? Beloved, we are living in an age and a time when the scriptures are being fulfilled. We see all of these things that have been long ago told, foretold and prophesied coming to pass. We're living in an age today when any, everything that's, that is vile and disgusting is now been made okay by society. We're living in a day when there's no wrong, there are no rules, it's do whatever you want to do. It doesn't make any difference. That's how the, that's the world that we're living in. Are we, say, are we supposed to think it's going to somehow get better? It's not going to get better until Jesus comes. This way is going to get more and more difficult. It's going to get more and more stressful. Beloved, the enemy is cranking up the pressure. You know that because you sense it every day, don't you? I see what some of y'all talk about, and I hear what some of y'all are dealing with and going through. It's a battle out there, isn't it? It's hard sometimes. It really is hard. But anyway, as I said, if you've been a distant follower, it's the time has come that you've got to decide. Either you're going to die to this flesh, you're going to put to, to death the deeds of this flesh and become a man after God's heart, or you're going to be swept away, swept away by the storm that's coming. There's no other choice. There's no other choice. I've made my choice. My feet are firmly planted. And I don't say that arrogantly or haughtily. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm as susceptible to failure and falling as anybody else. My feet are still made of clay. Amen. Same as yours. Same as yours. There's not a one of us. He said, take heed to, to him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed what? Lest he fall, right? So there's that possibility is always there. But what I'm saying to you, to all of us here tonight is I've made my choice. I know what it's like. And I believe I have a good handle on what's coming down the pipe. But nevertheless, Brother Ed, I have made my choice. My feet are planted. My last years are going to be going to be the best years I have ever had if God will help me to be so. Because either I'm going up or I'm going out. But Beloved, either way, I'm not going out laying down on God. Amen. Amen. I'm going up or I'm going out. Either way I go, I'm going to go out with a bang because I want the last years of my life to count for something. Don't you want to do what God wants you to do? Don't you know that there's a, there's, there are multitudes out here that are just waiting for what you have to give them? You know, Pastor and I, we worked and we got these little cards for you to hand out. And I think to myself, if ever was a way to do personal evangelism, there could never be anything more simpler than that. Hey, how you doing? I'd like to invite you to our church. Thank you. I mean, come on, really, seriously? How much more easily can we make this for you, right? But do you realize there's multitudes in Arcadia Nocatee and all these surrounding little areas around here, there are multitudes that don't go to church. They won't even think about darkening the door of a church. A lot of people have been hurt. A lot of people have been fed up. they got all excuses. They're just like Saul. Everybody got an excuse, don't they? But you know what? When it comes right down to it, excuses aren't going to matter. What matters is, did we follow God's heart? What matters is, did we do like David? Did when we faltered, did we pick ourselves back up and allow God to restore us? Or do we get like Saul and become bitter and, and, and discontented and just full of anger and just always wanting revenge and, and living that lifestyle? Have you ever known anybody that is always angry? I know people like that. I know plenty of people like that. You just wonder sometimes, is there nothing in this world that will put a smile on your face? Do you know anybody like that? You know why that is, don't you? It's because they are not submitting their life to God. This world is a terrible place to live if you don't have Jesus in your life. Amen. There's only one reason to have hope. We heard about it in Sunday school. We heard about it in the message. We hear it all the time in this church. If we are going to have any hope at all, it's going to be in God. Amen. I'm going to be a man after God's heart. How about you? 
I want to be a man after God's heart. I can't see. I can't see us so close to the finish line. So close to the finish line, Brother Ed. I can't see us now losing out after we've come this far. After we've come this this far on this journey with God. We cannot afford to lay down. Beloved, we've got to choose. We've got to be a man of God for God's own heart. We've got to lay aside this flesh. We've got to serve Him with all that's within us and be obedient to His voice. I don't know about you, but I feel God wants us to press in. God wants us to press in closer. Press in closer where there's safety, where the anointing is, where the power of God is. Beloved, in this last day that we're living in, we need the power of God. I've said this before. If there ever was a time when we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, it's the day that we're living in today. You and I, we cannot get through this world without God's power sustaining us and keeping us and leading us and guiding us and taking through the stormy waters and the fires that the enemy wants to drag us through. The power of God, the precious Holy Ghost, is our sustainer. we got to have it. We've got to have it. If we're going to be obedient to God, we need His presence in our life. Amen. You can't do this on your own. I'm trying to implore you to understand this tonight. Saul thought he could do it all by himself. And he lost the kingdom of Israel. His whole generation was lost. If Saul would have just been obedient, it wouldn't be David the psalmist. It might have been Saul the psalmist. We don't know. It might have been Saul that they sung the songs about instead of David. We don't know what God could have done with him had he just obeyed. Are you hearing me tonight? Oh, church of the living God, hear me tonight. We don't know. We've got to let God expand our vision. For so long, all we see, we've got tunnel vision. We do the things we do. Why? Because we've always done that. Lord, help us if we want to think outside the box. Come on, you know I'm telling you the truth. Beloved, listen to me. I love the heritage that we have. Wouldn't be here if it weren't for, for men and women of God who paved the way for you and I to have what we have here. I, I, I declare tonight that every preacher that ever came before me, I stand on their shoulders tonight because I didn't earn anything. They made the way for me, just like I'm trying to make it better for the next generation. And beloved, we've got to have an eye and a heart and eyes to the future and stop being so closed-minded and narrow-minded that we think God can't do something a different way. Amen. And I know that's hard for some of you. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm not being critical. I'm just telling you. We cannot afford, with the short amount of time that's left, we cannot afford to let opportunities pass us by. I'm telling you, we don't need to come in here and swing from the chandeliers. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is opening our heart. Be a man after God's own heart. God, is there some other way that I can reach these folks? God, I've tried every way I know, every way I know to reach these people, and they're not receptive to what I'm saying. God, is there some other way that I could tackle this? God, is there some other approach? Maybe I've never done it this way. And we need to be open to what God would have us to do. If it's not sin, what's wrong with God leading us a different direction? Come on. Come on. Aren't we all here for the same purpose? I don't know about you, but I'm here to win G people to Jesus. If I just want to go to church, I can do that anywhere. I can go anywhere and sit on a seat. That's all I'm interested in. But I don't want just that. I want, I want a harvest. Amen. I want a legacy. I want souls. I want to see people on the other side in glory that's going to come up to me one day and say, thanks, I appreciate it. It was hard for me to listen to, but I thank God that you said it. Just like I can list a whole bunch of names that if I ever get the opportunity in glory, I'm going to tell them, thank you. Thank you for telling me that what I was doing was wrong. Thank you for showing me a better way. Thank you for not sparing my little sensitivities and my precious little 
feelings, afraid I was going to get mad and go home. But you told me the truth, and because you did, I'm here today. And you and I have that same responsibility to the generation that's coming up. I thank God for the little children that we have. Do you know, as I told our Sunday school class this morning, we have a solemn obligation to this generation to raise them up and to train them and teach them. Beloved, as I I told the class this morning, our kids are subjected to 15,000 hours of worldly doctrination and all the things that's being crammed into their little brains. And we bring them in here on Sunday morning for 45 minutes and let them color a little picture of Noah's Ark and somehow that's supposed to get them uh, through the through the things they're dealing with. Honey, that's not going to work. Uh, that might have worked uh, in Mayberry, but honey, this is a different world today. We owe our children everything. We owe them a responsibility. We have a responsibility to teach them what God has to say. Not what the school board has to say. Not what the school system or the superintendent has to say. I really don't care what they say if I can just be blunt about it. Because at the end of the day, what's going to matter is what did God say? And what did I do with what God told me to do? Am I going to be like Saul and say, well, you know, uh, the school board said such and such, so that's why I didn't tell my kids uh, that, it was, that it was wrong uh, for, uh, for Adam and Steve to have relations. Uh, I didn't tell them that because the school board told me I should not do that. Therefore, I backed off. Honey, listen, when we stand before a mighty God, we aren't going to be concerned uh, with those kinds of things because God is keeping a record. I'm going to say it again. God is keeping track. I don't know how he's doing it. I don't know which what method he uses. He's God, and I know he has the capability to do so. But I know this. One day is going to come when the books are going to be opened. There's going to be a great day come, uh, and the books are going to be opened. Uh, amen. And everything that we've done, uh, Sister Shanna, everything you did that's not under the blood is going to be right there. It's going to be right there, Bobby. If you didn't get it under the blood... Uh, Dave, if you if you thought you well, I'm just going to let that one go. I guarantee you, you're going to you're going to see it one day. We're all going to see it one day if we don't get it taken care of. Well, praise God. Oh, honey, we got we got to be serious about this. We've got to be serious about this. Please, God, help us. We get off and shake off these heavy bands of complacency that's lulled us to sleep to where we've got a form and a fashion. Beloved, I remember a day when I got saved. I remember an old man, old preacher man would, would be talking about how that uh, this church over yonder, at, that church downtown, and that church on the other side of town, those big fancy formal places, you don't want nothing to do with that. Why? Well, they've just got a form of godliness and they're just putting on a show. You don't want anything to do with that. Guess what? It's come home to roost. It surely has. And I know you don't like to hear that. Why? Because we have found out how to do church. Amen. I'm going to say it again. We have figured out how to play church. We can't play church. We can't play church. We can't fool God. We can't fool God. God knows our hearts. He knows the very thoughts and intents of our heart. He knows our motives. He knows what motivates us to do and say the things that we do. He knows every time he's told us to go and do something and we've decided not to do it. Every single time, he knows. He knows. I've told you all this story. And I'm going to hurry up and close. Because I know you all got to get to the wherever you go. Your favorite show comes on at 7.30, I guess. I don't know. I told you this story. I I need to share this because it's going to fit here. A long, long time ago, I was going to a little church. A young couple had little kids, little bitty kids. They didn't have any money. The Lord laid on my heart to go by the grocery store after Sunday night service and pick up a gallon of milk, take it to their house. Now, here's the deal. Here's the thing. That was out of my way. It was an inconvenience. Okay? It was like seven miles from my house where they lived. And I'm like, oh, come on, really? And besides that, I was a preacher. I can't be bothered with that. I'm just being honest with you. I hadn't been in the ministry very long at all. And I knew nothing. And I was about to prove to myself I knew nothing. Don't laugh. 
She thinks I still don't. <laughs> Long story short, I didn't do it. As clear as I'm standing here, I heard the voice of God tell me to do that. And I argued and excused my way out of it. No big deal. I went home. I want to say I slept fine, but I don't think I did. But anyway, I went, it was all right. Everything was fine until the next Sunday. When I saw Sister Kathy and I said, how's it going? She goes, well, it's going all right. God's good or whatever, you know, how we all like to talk, right? She said, but uh, been kind of a rough week. She said, uh, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, my babies didn't have any milk. I wish she'd have just killed me. Brother Ed, I wish she'd have just stuck a dagger in me because that's what happened to me. I was in Indiana, Brother Harry. I was in Indiana preaching one night for a little Free Will Baptist Church. About two or three rows back, the whole row was full of little kids. Unbeknownst to me, they all belonged to the same mom and daddy. But I mean, they, was a, uh, they had a gospel group and then some. And I was preaching... And I happened to notice, as I typically do, kind of wander around, you know, and I happened to notice these little kids, they were just not, they weren't dirty, they were nasty. They had no shoes. And you could tell they hadn't had shoes in a, in a good while, right? And the Lord began to deal with me that whatever money I got in this offering, which wasn't much, to give them, give that money to their mom and daddy to buy some shoes. And you know what I did? I did it. Why? Because I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. I didn't say that because, oh, wow, you're such a great person. It wasn't that easy. It wasn't that easy. Because, Brother Harry, I had to drive, I don't know, it was a hundred and some miles back, back to Ohio. And I didn't know if I was going to make it. But I said, God, if you're telling me to give this money, because these little kids need this a whole lot more than I need gas in my car, I think I'll make it. And I did make it. I did make it. Why did I tell you that? Because God is still dealing with us to minister and reach out to people. We're here because God has a need for you. And that need is not for us to just sit on our chair. But you're his hands and his feet. You're his arms and his legs. You're the voice that he wants to speak life and health and, and whatever somebody else needs. A loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, a box of cereal, a pair of cheap tennis shoes, whatever it might be. You see, that's the heart of God. And when we say we're a man or a woman after God's own heart, those are the things we do, Brother Dave. And we do them when we do, we do it cheerfully don't we the lord loves a cheerful giver doesn't he amen, amen. i've got a, a, a lifetime of positive and negatives the same as you do i hope by the time my race is run that the positives will overtake the negatives amen, amen? because i've got a many things in my life in, in serving god that i've i know i didn't go the right way i know i didn't i can't do a thing about it Except what David did. God, I have sinned because I didn't do it your way. I tell my sweet wife, she's so tired of me talking about this. But to this day, to this very day, I regret ever leaving the church that I pastored. To this day. Think about that. That's been over. Yeah. Pastor Lonnie's hair was dark then. I mean, we're talking olden days, right? But you know what? We can't undo those things. What we can do is make a difference in somebody's life from this day forward. And that's what we need to be focused on. I'm going to close. That's what we need to be focused on, beloved, is how can, how can I make myself available Amen. How many of you remember Pastor Lonnie preaching a sermon called Fat? Dave does. Pastor Lonnie does, thank goodness. And me, I think. I thought it was better than that. But maybe not. Anyway. Faithful. Available. 
teachable. Think about that. Faithful, available, teachable. That's what God is looking for. Make yourself available. Be faithful to what he's called you to do. But don't ever think you've arrived because God is working, still working on all of us, isn't he? Amen. Can we find a place to pray? Just, let's just press in for just a few moments. Let's look to God. Let's ask God to transform our hearts. Lord, help us tonight to be a man or a woman after your heart. Lord, help us to seek your will for our life. Not my will, Lord, not like Saul did, but Lord, help me to follow your heart.